So we've talked about a lot of legendary lords, or at least possible legendary lords for Total War Warhammer 2 II and 3. And one of those lords that I think kind of plays hand in hand with one of the other lords that I would like to see so much, Eltharion, is Grom the Paunch. And we haven't talked about him, but there is so much lore encompassing him and, and kind of like his majesty and his legacy. He kind of has this insane history behind him, especially for the fact that he is a goblin. So today what we're going to talk about is Grom the Paunch, if I didn't give that away already. And we're going to do this in the typical fashion that we do. I'm going to talk about the lore blurb, we're going to talk about the magic items and special rules. But then we're going to go into the deeper seated lore and history of old Grom Ponchy Ponch here. So let's let's start off here with uh, the actual lore blurb and we'll get that out of the way because there is quite a bit to go into. This is going to be one of the larger uh, larger legendary lord video since there is uh, so many goodies to caress and touch on and all this kind of disgusting imagery I'm going to use. But Grom the Ponch of Misty Mountain. Gobbos are cowardly and disloyal, but nothing stirs their wicked hearts like Grom, mightiest of goblin war bosses. Stories of Grom's greatness still command attention around any goblin camp, and if a shaman could should conjure his superlative-sized image, even the most boisterous gobba will behave with reverence. In Grom's looming presence, goblins will stand straight, refrain from grumbling backtalk, and even limit the rampant nose-picking. These ultimate displays of respect are because, to lowly goblins, Grom is a living god, the embodiment of everything that they will never be large, ferocious, and idolized. It was not always so. Grom's meteoric rise began when, as a young boss of the Broken Axe tribe, he consumed a portion of raw troll. As troll flesh regenerates and Grom, always a big eater, had not stopped to cook the meat meal, the foul meat writhed in his belly. The race to regrow against the race to digest was on. A lesser goblin would have burst asunder, but Grom was made of sterner stuff. The battle of the belly, as the deed came to be known, changed Grom. He grew to prodigious size. It is said that on that day, Grom last saw his own legs. Yet so huge and powerful had Grom grown that he no longer needed to see them, and could instead order others to see his legs for him. So Grom's legend began. He quickly rose to the warlord of the Broken Axe tribe, and they spent many happy years plundering the Wolflands, the Badlands, and the Southern World's Edge Mountains. By this time, Grom had taken to fighting atop a chariot, as it suited his grandiose proportions. Many goblins traveled far to see De Greaton and join his exploits, and, as it peaks, Grom's Wa contained hundreds of different tribes. Grom carved his name large in the psyches of men, psyches of men, dwarfs, and elves, in whose realms he is still feared and cursed. Even now, rumors sweep the Badlands that his corpulent majesty has returned and is once again amassing an army to launch a new invasion. Oof, you guys have no idea how much in the uh, psyche of uh, men, dwarfs, and elves he, he kind of planted himself, but... <clears throat> He's a bit of a different lord here. So, for, for starters, he's a goblin. We don't see really any big deal goblins in the Warhammer Fantasy universe outside of uh, just a handful, and he is part of that handful. Uh, just the way the orc muscle culture and the way the orc hierarchy is, I mean, they, they give reverence to larger sized things. You know, the big, muscular, hulked out, steroided black orcs are clearly the stronger and uh, beefier and um, <clears throat> leaders of the orc nation. <laughs> and because of that, or that is because of the fact that as orcs fight, they grow in size, they get darker in skin, their their tusks get longer, um, they get bigger, all sorts of awesome awesome stuff. And by in, in imbibing and, and, and eating that uh, troll flesh, it has made Grom far larger than your than your average bear than your average goblin here <clears throat> and as a result we have this goblin lord on a chariot of all things and that's kind of uh, that's something a little different in and of itself right as far as a legendary lord goes for the greenskins that's why i think he would be such an amazing addition to the total war warhammer 2 roster and you know i've, I've talked about this blue into the face but they are going to have to release some sort of goodies coming up to total war warhammer 3 because there's such a huge stopgap, and he would be a great way um to introduce something into the Mortal Empires, but also into the Vortex, Vortex campaign, because he could he could fit into either one pretty well. We'll talk about that here in a second. But let's go over his kind of special rules here. So he has Niblet. <clears throat> this is kind of Grom's little 
assistant of sorts. He carries his standard and kind of hangs out on the back of the chariot. I just wanted to bring that up there. I don't think they would do anything crazy with that. I just think he would be there if anything. Like, maybe in the actual campaign start screen, you'd see Grom, like, screaming and yelling at the screen like all the other lords do. And then Nibla just like, just like kind of scurrying around behind him and between his legs. He's a little tiny, disgusting little goblin. Um, but he's also, of course, on that chariot, has some giant wolves that are leading the chariots, three to be exact. But he's got some magic items here. He's got the Axe of Grom. This is uh, the fabled Axe of Grom is also known as Elf Biter. And what this essentially does is increases his strength and gives him Killing Blow. And, and benefit from the Killing Blow is better rule. In addition, against Elves, Grom's Axe will cause a Killing Blow on a roll of five or six. Sorry, I wanted to make sure I got that right. So... Um, we'll go into his hate for the elves, but as, as a whole, goblins are terrified of elves. He does not have that, uh, that fear built into him. And the fact that his axe of Grom is called Elf Biter kind of plays into that overall lore and underarching um, infrastructure that is uh, set in his, uh, his personality. And what I would see this kind of translating into in Total War Warhammers is a weapon that gives you melee attack, gives you weapon strength, and then gives you... Um, an anti-infantry and AP kind of characteristics the way we always see Killing Blow kind of translated. I think it would be something kind of cool like that. I don't think they, I've, I haven't seen anything where they do something specific to a specific race, like oh, here's a bonus against this race, so on and so forth, like the tabletop does. So I think that they would kind of forego the whole portion of it assisting the Killing Blow against elves. He also has his lucky banner. Uh, his lucky banner just kind of gives him a little minor ward save. Just a five up ward save in the tabletop, so nothing huge. But he does have regeneration. So picture this kind of large, fat goblin on this three wolf led chariot with regeneration. So, I mean, that's kind of very intimidating in the Total War arena because chariots can do a lot of damage to the right kind of armies. And if you have a chariot that is a little bit more stalwart, a little bit stronger as far as its toughness goes, um, melee defense and uh, melee armor considered kind of actually stays in combat for a little bit longer and it can regenerate, that's kind of scary. That's kind of, the one thing about a chariot is that it can be kind of countered pretty quickly and it, and it can get knocked out fast, but if it's a stronger, more, you know, stout chariot and has a regeneration, I think it's gonna be pretty amazing. Because I think that we're, we're kind of lacking really good, true chariot lords. The Tomb Kings obviously have them and other races have options for their, their lords, but you know, like, this is like this is like a green skin Sertha Ek, more or less, you know, guys. Like this is kind of what I think would be different and interesting and cool because so many lords rely on maybe their really awesome horse in Malhandir for Tyrion, or maybe their really cool dragon in Malekith and his dragon. So I think that this is a very different route. I mean, we have the Tomb Kings and on the uh, uh, Chariot of the Gods for uh, Cetra, but not a whole ton outside of that. I believe Wolfric could be on a chariot as well, but there's not a ton of really strong you know, named chariot riding charioteers. And I think this would be a really cool one, especially for the Greenskins, who have a bunch of weird mechanics as it is. But his special rules are um, eats elves for breakfast. That's literally the name of the rule. And that, like I was saying, he just doesn't suffer fear from elves. Also, he has Grom's Waw. Now, we know that um, orc war bosses have a Waw ability that I think it gives 34 or 44 attack to everyone in range. Um, that is the same exact ability here. So I would see that conferring to, rather than him being a goblin war boss, which doesn't have that ability, Grom would have access to that ability so he could buff up everyone he kind of, you know, roves through on his chariot and buffs up the uh, the front line as he's kind of pushing through and pathing through the enemies. But that, that kind of squares away the rules for Grom and the little lore background that from the, from the eighth edition book. But let's jump into the overarching history of Grom. And that is very important here. So we're going to read this lore blurb from the end of the... Uh, so the 8th edition's got its little tiny... Hey, here's a little, here's a little history about Grom. Here's the special rules. And here's another little like excerpt from the history. So we're going to read that excerpt here real quick because it's important because it's going to lead into the rest of the history of Grom the Punch. So, the challenge of Thunder Mountain. Within a year of the troll-eating incident, Grom was already large and in charge of the Broken Axe tribe. So I know that sentence sounds like I wrote it. I didn't, I swear to God. <laughs> I'm saying this is directly from the book. The tribe had grown considerably, but had yet to test their strength against the most formidable power in the region, Zok Gustaba, orc war boss of the Gutstaba tribe. 
Zok and his orcs had recently conquered the night goblins that lived in and under Thunder Mountain. Many of the Broken Axe goblins felt they should run from the larger orcs or submit to their rule. Grom, however, had other ideas. Grom set out alone in his axe, with his axe slung over his mighty shoulder. When word reached Zok, the orc demanded the Goblin King be allowed to journey without ambush. He would teach the lumpy Gabo a lesson himself. When Grom made it to the Gut Stabo's camp, he found Zok waiting for him, already encircled by a ring of bloodthirsty onlookers. Grom's size was impressive. He was less muscled than Zok, but far larger in girth. The battle was short and brutal. Zok landed a blow with his cleaver, but before everyone's eyes, the gaping wound healed itself. Zok's, mis Zok's dismemberment, however, did not. Grom's takeover bid for Gutstabas was only resolved after he slew every orc big boy in the tribe. Grom was so exhausted, he sat his bulk down, directly on top of a diminutive night goblin. All expected to find just a black cowl and an oozy stain beneath Grom's mass, but the Night Goblin not only survived, he sprang forth with a magical grin on his face. Taking this great fortune as a sign from Mork, Grom instantly promoted the, the lucky Night Goblin to carry his standard. So that's the birth of Niblet. And uh, why that's so important is this is really the start of Grom's wow this is what, what this is what really kind of empowers him he he takes a large horde of goblins and as we know a wa is typically an orc and goblin massive green tide now uh, we've talked again about how the hierarchy typically goes you know snotling goblin orc with um those little guys i can't think of the name of right now um dudes that jump on two legs um, they're, they're somewhere in between that whole mix, and I'm sure I'll think of it as I, as I continue through this video. But the important thing here is that that's the typical hierarchy. The, go the goblins don't typically rule over all of orcdom like Grom's doing clearly right now. So Grom starts this big wad around 2410 IC, and what he does is he immediately goes for the dwarf holds. He's in Blackfire Pass, so he's kind of deep nestled within the World's Edge Mountains here. Um, it even says, you know, Grom pa the Paunch of Misty Mountain. So... Um, and Thunder Mountain is not the ride. Again, it's one of the one of the largest three mountains of the Warhammer universe. So he, eventually, he he squares off against King Bregaric in the Battle of Iron Gate. And during this time, he kind of uh, he gets he completely destroys the dwarf army. And it, it's very unexpected because the dwarfs they they understand the hierarchy of, of uh, the Greenskins. They know okay, it's goblins. We can kind of well, let's kind of hang back here. We don't, don't take this too seriously. They put in their JV team. We'll we'll deal with these before we hit the big boys. But what actually ends up happening is they they decimate this dwarf army. And and what happens is the dwarfs freak out. They're like, oh ooh ooh, this is way more this is way more serious than we originally thought. So they send out to the Empire for aid. You know, hey, we need some help in dealing with this massive wall. And the Empire at the time is ruled by Dieter the Fourth. Um, what a great name. And he's the Electric Count of Sterling. And it's important to note here that he is, for lack of a better word, it just he's a coward. He's just a, a bitch with a capital B. Um, essentially, Altdorf is where the capital of the Empire is now. But it used to be housed in Nuln. Nuln used to be the capital. And it had um, Dieter's golden palaces because he was all about like the flowery things, the decadent things of the title of emperor. He was all about like his harems and all sorts of stuff, but he never did anything for the people. He never did anything for the military, the technology of the empire. He was very much a, a throwaway emperor and, and a coward at, at the at, with a capital C. So as a result, uh, the dwarf messengers come to Dieter and like, yo, we need help with this, this massive wall. And they and and Dieter says, mm, "Good, good. This is this is all good news. Thank you very much, Dwarf emissaries. I appreciate your help." And then takes the capital from Nuln and moves it to Altdorf, which is further away from the conflict. He's so afraid of the conflict and getting involved that he literally moves the entire uh, figurehead of um, the spiritual and figurehead of uh, the Emperor away from this conflict. So this, as you would have expected gets jot down in the Book of Grudges for the Dwarfs. And from there, uh, this doesn't stop Grom, of course. You know, Grom kind of goes from uh, portion to portion of the Dwarf Empire trying to eke some sort of gold and riches from this. And the Dwarfs, for the most part, just, just hole up in their holds. 
as to be really expected here. And the uh, goblins can't really find purchase in any hold. And that's a very common thing for goblins or skaven to take over a hold and then just, just chill there, to be fine there for, you know, perpetuity. Not the case. Since they couldn't find a mass, a, a major holding in any of these holds, Grom's army starts to, to just swell and swell and swell. You know, he's got these goblins that are coming from the Darklands. He's got wolf riders coming up from the wolf lands that are in the south. And he's, his massive wa is getting even bigger. And this is a point where even orcs are joining into it. He's got black orc war, black orc war bosses that are actually second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and whatever in command of his armies are actually helping him, which is very uncharacteristic. So what happens is that Grom leads this army into the Empire. Now, the Empire, we know, is bordered on the uh, easternmost edge of it to the uh, to the mountains. We have Ostermark, Sylvania, which is unfortunately part of the, kind of part of the Empire, but not really, you know, the whole, you know, them being vampires. The Moot, Averland, and uh, Vissenland, which is all the way to the south. So what he does is, he kind of comes through the top, um, around Ostermark, through Talabekland, into Stirland, into Hockland, and destroys all of it. He, he just rampages through the entirety of the Empire. And it's such a massive green tide. Like this is, it's compared in the books to the green tides that Sigmar Heldenhammer had to fight against during the very, very beginning and advent of the Empire. So you have this just kind of massive horde sweeping through the entire nation unimp unimpeded. And the interesting thing here is that no one can really raise an army against them because the Empire is not really taking a stance against them. And it really doesn't kind of... There's no real resistance to this until Prince Wilhelm, who is actually the cousin to Dieter, does anything. He, he kind of decides, hey, uh, Prince Wilhelm, that is, just heads. <clears throat> the only way we can do this is if we just fight the, sing the singular pockets of Grom's army. Because what Grom does is he kind of... He eventually takes Nuln and just sits there in Nuln on a, a, a mound, a massive mountain of treasure, just kind of like fingering his belly button and just drinking gold coins because he's a disgusting little creature. And this obviously pisses off a lot of the other orcs who are meant to fight, not just to kind of count gold and, and rub their fingers together. So the army kind of scatters throughout the entirety of the empire rather than being one succinct, moving, destructive force of green. So this, this kind of, you know, prompts Prince Wilhelm to destroy and fight these little pockets that are not the grander army. And this helps to eventually shape the course of the Wa. Rather than the Wa, you know, blitzing through Reichland, which is the breadbasket of the entirety of the empire. Like this is where a lot of the crops come from. Uh, Talabeklin is majority swamps. Uh, Stirling and, and Ostermark are dominated a lot by the, uh, the Great Forest. Hockland is almost entirely mountain. Ostland kind of sits right on the edge next to Kislev, and it has tons and tons of just snow and uh, uh, barren plains, as well as Nordland and um, Vesterland. The only other two, re the only region that is really kind of a, I guess you could say, flourishing crop growing area, aside from Reichland, is Marienburg and uh, uh, Averland. And Averland is really not the kind of agricultural powerhouse that Reichland is, but. As a result, though, Wilhelm kind of helps divert the course of the Wa more north or just away from Reichland. And Grom just kind of sits on his haunches, pun intent, not intended, and kind of intended because I'm a fucking genius, <laughs> and uh, sits there just kind of enjoying himself. But eventually, the shaman Blacktooth, and this guy's important because he's kind of, he's kind of corrupted and he's kind of, um, he doesn't say that he's possessed by a demon, but it's very hinted in the way that he approaches what's about to happen next. But he, he essentially tells Grom, like, yo, Gork and Mork have a prophecy that we have to take to the sea and we have to sail to the west. And this immediately lights a fire under Grom's ass. He goes from being like just, uh, I'm going to count my coins to fanatic, let's go, let's do this. Gork and Mork have brought me so much uh, wealth, fame, and notoriety so far. They know what's best, let's move. And as we know, the orcs place a lot of emphasis in Gork and Mork. The, the reason that their entire magic system works in, in 40, in Warhammer 40,000, the entire, all their, <clears throat> the reason all their technology works is because of their belief in Gork and Mork. So it's a very huge centerpiece of the uh, Greenskin um, way of life and culture. So rather than just going west, because obviously they're in Nuln. Nuln faces, as we know from the, from our uh, playing of Total War Warhammer 1, 
opposite of Nuln is uh, Paravon and the Forest of Loran. So he goes from Nuln north, back through Stirling, back through Talabeckland, um, into Middenland. And there's a big, huge fight in Middenheim as he goes all the way north into Middenheim. And this is where his, his chariot gets blown up, and he gets a new chariot. And the chariot's actually constructed from the t uh, a temple of... Uh, of uh, uh, not Ulrich, but a uh, temple of the White Wolf, that's the name of it. And um, it, it's, it's put together from the roof of that temple, and he, he gives it a really great name. The name of the chariot is Chariot of Grom. I swear to God, that's it. That's the unoriginal name that a goblin would think of. But he takes that and he moves north and destroys mar like huge, huge portions of Nordland. I mean, there's pretty much the only place he doesn't really get to, aside from like you know Averland and, and Visenland, is like Reichland. He he kind of he burns through Westerland to make it all the way to the uh, coast. And at this point, he assembles a massive fleet massive massive fleet and there's there's some orcs that are saying like hey you know you can't do this we are orcs we have to be fighting the orc boys should not be building they should be fighting so grom in in very orcish faction fa and fashion kills them anyone who opposes him gets killed and this is kind of you know a repeating motif for how grom has made himself such a huge portion of the greenskin army is by saying hey you oppose me you're dead i'm not a small goblin i'm a big boy i'm gonna crush you so Eventually, he, he assembles this, this army, and it's important to note that Grom doesn't have the kind of ordered movement of, say, a regimental or a standard military of, say, the High Elves or the Empire or any other professional army for that matter. He's a greenskin. Their army is very kind of whimsical and, and does as they please what Gork and Mork say. So this isn't the original green tie that came down from the mountains and burned through the majority of the empire. This is just pretty much everyone who was, oh, Grom's moving north, let's go with him. So it's a smaller portion, but still a large portion nonetheless. And what happens is they, as they take to these seas, they're kind of moving west and they get into a large pitched battle with the Imperial Navy um, under Admiral von Kron Kronitz. And the funny thing here is that they, they had been shadowing the, the Greenskin Navy for quite some time, and they said to themselves, all right, well, we're not going to attack them. They don't know what they're doing on those ships anyway, so we'll just kind of let their ineptitude cull their herd, more or less, and we'll attack at the last second. But they were starting to move towards the, uh, the delta of the mighty Reichland, and he stopped them from attacking Marienburg. And as a result, this kind of massive squall helped push the remainder of the Greenskins west. But what is directly west of the Empire and Bretonia, Ulthuan, land of the High Elves. And this is where we get the mighty kind of uh, adversity and the huge feud between a very specific named gentleman, Eltharion, and Grom the Ponch. Because as they move west, uh, they land on Ivris. Now, we've talked about how Ulthuan is protected majority, or mainly from all of these runes and all of these um, magical spells that, that would divert the kind of wandering traveler. And the fact that he was able to land one ship, let alone many a ship, is insanely uncommon. And Blacktooth, the shaman that kind of told Grom where to go, is suspected to be kind of leading the, the magic that would bring them to Ivris. And this kind of, they, they tell, or Blacktooth tells Grom, hey, you know, you have to go onto that island. You have to look for these waystones. And these waystones are where are controlling a lot of magic, fell magic there. We have to destroy these. And of course, those waystones are what, what has created the vortex. And that vortex is obviously holding back the gigantic chaos demon tied to the north. So, <clears throat> as Grom raids and pillages through Ivris, they destroy each one of these waystones. And with each one destroyed, Blacktooth gets stronger and stronger and more and more I guess, winds of magic drunk, I guess that's what I'm going to go with, but he just kind of gets bloated off all this. And essentially, eventually, they, they land on Tor Ivrith, which is the main capital of the of the nation of Ivrith itself. And this is huge because, you know, there's not really a lot of other portions of Ivrith. We've talked about how it's a relatively barren land. It doesn't have a ton of um, keeps and strongholds within it. But Tor Ivrith is singularly guarded by one large host. And the host comes out of Tor Ivrith rather than staying behind its walls to fight Grom. Kind of thinking, hey, these barbarians might outnumber us, but we're high elves, we have the advantage. Foolish! 
as you would expect, <laughs> Grom kind of rides through the high elf line over and over and over, even though the goblins are terrified and getting kind of cut down with the quick um, stabbing and, and, and swipes of the elf infantry, they're still kind of held together by the unifying force that is Grom the Paunch. And eventually they, they destroy that initial host and start laying siege to Tor Ivris for um, weeks at a time. Well, four weeks. It is a long siege is what I'm trying to say. And eventually they break through and it's kind of at this, this, this ultimate tipping point, right? And it always isn't everything in Warhammer, but if one more of these waystones gets destroyed, then Ulthuan goes under. It's just going to sink under the seas. The, uh, the vortex is going to break open, and here comes another gigantic demon horde. Now, Blacktooth, again, this is where I'm, at, I'm saying that he might have some sort of demonic influences in him, but at the same time, I think he's just power drunk. I think he's gotten so much of the winds of magic imbibed into him, or imbued. I keep wanting to say that word imbibed. It doesn't fit. Imbued into him by, by breaking open these waystones that it actually is starting to affect him to the point where he can't kind of rein it in, lock it up. So, as he kind of stands over the, the last waystone, there's this very dramatic and sweeping moment where Altharian the Grim sweeps down on his griffin and just takes his head off in one swoop. Just whoop. I just think of that moment in uh, Lord of the Rings Two Towers when uh, the riders of Rohan charge down the hill, and there's a one quick shot where this one rider jumps over an orc and just kind of just quickly sink and just shoom, the little guy's head just flies off in the air. I think that same moment happening right there. Probably because I love Eltharian and I love the High Elves, and I hate the Greenskins. But, you know, I'm not biased at all. This is an unbiased, historical, subjective uh, opinion of the, of the matter, the Eltharian rules. That's what I'm trying to say. But what happens is Eltharian brings his more veteran um, Wardens of Ivris to bear, and he brings all of his troops to help the beleaguered and, and the uh, and help relieve Tor Ivris. And this this kind of conjunctive attack with uh, the reinforcements, with the fresh troops, with Eltharian having killed Blacktooth, essentially puts the, causes a shockwave throughout the Greenskins. And as you expect, just like they are in Total War Warhammer, if you charge them enough, they will flee. Um, this does happen. Grom's army starts to fall apart all over the place. The goblins, for the most part, start fleeing away from all this this quick lightning strike and 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 this killing of one of their leaders. And there's a and there quite literally is a lightning storm above them. So all this kind of terrifies the goblins who mass who uh, rout in mass. And the result is that Grom, shattered as well, flees the battlefield. So the result is though ultimately that you've got Grom the Paunch. Who disappears? He he kind of vanishes from history. He's and he's one of the older characters. I mean, he's in fourth edition. He's in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth editions. He's a very old greenskin character. So he's been with the the hobby for a long time. And I think that as an option for Total War Warhammer two, he would make a lot of sense. Like if you think about this, where could you have Grom the Paunch start? Well, he could start in the mountains of Tor Ivris as a random event in the High Elf campaign. Or he could just start there as a starting portion for a possible greenskin campaign on the Vortex map. You know, just call it Grom's Wa, would be the name of that faction. Um, if on the actual Mortal Empires campaign, you could have him start in the Misty Mountain, which would be really fun to be able to kind of relive Grom's Wa, right? You drive through the eastern portion of the Empire, then up into the northern portion of the Empire, then west all the way over to Ulthwan, trying to get to Tor Ivris. I think that'd be amazing. Like, what if you added a DLC pack? That was called The Paunch and the Grim, because Eltharian's, you know, kind of side title is The Grim. I don't know, they already did The Grim and the Grave, but fuck. Maybe maybe just The Paunch and the Warden, because he's the Warden of Tor Ivris. I'll go with that. Haha! -ha! The Warden and the Paunch. The Paunch and the Warden, that's what I'm sticking with. And Eltharian could start in a Mortal Empires campaign in the Elven Ruins right south of Sudenburg, because Eltharian, we know from our, our video on Eltharian, that he spent a lot of time in the Southlands uh, fighting off Greenskins, and he has kind of that pension for fighting Greenskins. Or in a uh, Vortex campaign, he just starts in Tor Ivris. So I think it'd be really amazing to see both of these lords at it at the same time. And I will have a link to, to my Eltharian video at the end of this, so at least you guys can go on over to Eltharian and see his lore as well to kind of contrast this. I talk about the relationship between Grom and Eltharian in this video though, so, and I had, I had promised people in Eltharian video I would do a video on Grom, so there's that. But I think it's, it's a really good 
way to get a lot more longevity and, and, and a different approach to playing the Vortex or Mortal Empires campaign in a really fun way. And I think that Grom the Paunch is, again, one of the most iconic Greenskin lords and one of the most important ones to the, not just the Greenskin history, but the Dwarf, the Empire, and the Elf history. But that kind of concludes our video for here today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one on Grom the Paunch. Uh, there is, it's kind of a dense one. He, there, he goes through a lot of places. So hopefully this made enough sense to you and, and the maps kind of help lay out enough area that you get essentially his kind of rampage through the majority of uh, the empire here. But as always, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, don't forget to like and comment below. Go ahead and subscribe if you do like me talking about uh, all this stuff, even though I make it all up. I just, it's not even real. None of it's real. No, I'm just kidding. It's all from books. <laughs> um, but go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, comment below, and thanks for watching today, guys. We'll have plenty of goodies coming out this week. We'll probably be having a video on those Sisters of Battle I was promising last week, as well as some other Warhammer 40k stuff. I want to start getting into more of that lore, as uh, the Total War Warhammer is going to be probably stagnant for this month until we get into the fabled release of Norska whenever that happens in May, or if it's still happening in May, we'll find out, I guess. But uh, I think... I think now is a good time to hit on some 40k stuff. But if you want to hear anything in specific, do let me know in the comment section. Always willing to do uh, the lore that you guys want. But thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one and take care.